I'm Carl Challen. I'm current chief of staff here at McLeod Regional. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to our Lunch and Learn. Uh, we've been working hard trying to find better ways to serve you at the appropriate time and the appropriate uh, topics. Uh, so thank you everyone for coming. Uh, today, uh, if any of you don't know, our speaker is Johnson Walker. He's the uh, medical director of trauma services and he's been here for what, five? five years, uh, and I've get to, I have the opportunity to work with him on many occasions, and I think we're going to uh, have a good topic here right now, talking about the resuscitation of the trauma patient. So welcome everybody, and welcome Dr. Walker. Thank you. Well, thank you all for having me. Um, uh, as Dr. Chellen said, I'm John Walker. This is my sixth year here at McLeod, um, and uh, uh, we're happy to be here. When Dr. Elia gave me this topic to discuss back in well, maybe February or March, I thought, no, I got plenty of time to work on this thing. And, and so I finished it two nights ago, um, started it about four nights ago. So anyway, uh, you know, that it's, and nothing changes in life, right? You still, you think you have seven months to do something and you don't. Uh, but I'm excited about this topic, and I tell our APPs all the time because it's not, uh, it's not as, as straightforward as, as it, uh, it might seem uh, superficially. When uh, this topic was announced and the, the PDF went out about the, the, um, uh, the presentation, one of my good friends who's a, a physician here texted me and said, what, are you going to talk about blood and IV fluids for an hour? And, and yes, I am, but uh, there's a lot more to it, and so let's get into it. First, I'll tell you about my financial disclosures. I unfortunately don't have any. Um, my next one is I have a few disclaimers. Anytime the, so that any trauma talk uh, has to include some pictures that are uh, maybe displeasing to the general population, and so uh, IV fluids and blood talk is no different, uh, and those may or may not have anything to do with the presentation, but at least there's something to look at. So anytime you see this green guy in the corner of the screen, there's a a potentially objectionable picture coming, and so if you don't want to look at it, then that's your warning. So what we're going to do, uh, why does this even matter? Why are we here to talk about this? We're going to talk about the initial evaluation of a trauma patient. We're going to go through what's called the ATLS protocol. We're going to talk about why the patient is unstable, and then we're going to talk about what the goals of resuscitation are in these patients. So first, trauma is one of the leading causes of death worldwide. In the United States, it's the leading cause of death in young adults. Traumatic injuries range from isolated wounds to life-threatening injuries. As you can see, uh, in young adults age 1 to 46, trauma is by far the leading cause of death. And so it's important. There's a trimodal distribution of, of uh, mortality in trauma. The first peak of trauma happens immediately after the trauma, within the first few seconds to the first few minutes after the injury. This is something that um, death generally results from apnea due to a severe brain injury, a traumatic brain injury, major lacerations of the heart, the great vessels, the aorta, or uh, a, a very high spinal cord injury. And typically this is something that no matter what is done, this is a non-survivable injury. Very few of these patients ever present to the hospital. The second peak of mortality and trauma occurs within minutes to hours following the injury. Deaths that occur in this period are typically related to subdural or epidural hematomas, he, uh, hemanumathoraces, lacerations of the solid organs, the spleen and the liver, pelvic fractures, and multiple other um, injuries associated with major blood loss. And then the third peak of mortality and trauma occurs within weeks to e within days to even weeks following the injury, and typically this is related to sepsis and multiple organ dysfunction syndrome. The quality of care that's delivered in the first two peaks determines the third peak in these patients. So as you can see, these injuries, the predominance of them happen within the first hour to first few hours after a trauma uh, injury. The, meta the, the, the significant majority of trauma mortality happens within what's described as the golden hour. The golden hour of trauma resuscitation is where 80% of trauma deaths occur. The golden hour is characterized by a need for rapid assessment, rapid evaluation, rapid resuscitation, and these are the fundamentals of the advanced trauma life support system. So what do we do when a patient is coming to our hospital? Similar to a medical code, a trauma resuscitation is among the most resource-intensive and time-pressured event in any hospital setting. The severity of the patient's injuries, the number of team members required, the number of simultaneous evaluation and management steps needed all contribute to the complexity of the environment. To manage this complexity, 
a systematic, team-based and process-focused approach is needed to rapidly identify and treat life-threatening injuries and minimize team errors. We designate a specific room and a team for the trauma resuscitation. This helps to ensure that the needed resources are immediately available. These things are like chest tube trays, thoracotomy trays, central line kits, intraosseous vascular access kits, and that the, no, the team members know they're supposed to be there and they have a specific role. Physicians, nurses, x-ray technicians, respiratory therapists, pharmacists, and other hospital personnel needed for the trauma resuscitation are identified in advance so that they know that they should come and assume their roles for the resuscitation. These are seemingly simple preparations that ensure that the arriving patient has the maximal resources available at the receiving hospital. Before arrival to the hospital, pre-hospital providers transmit information to hospital providers about the mechanism of injury, the status of the patient, and the initial treatments that have been given. This information alerts the team to specific equipment or resources or to summon essential personnel uh, dependent upon what the patient um, presentation is. At our hospital, we have an intake form that looks like this that lives beside the intake phone in the emergency room. And this is a, uh, a triage sheet that allows the patient uh, allows the, the pre-hospital providers to tell our facility what the patient looks like, what they're doing, uh, the mechanism of injury, their, their hemodynamics, and allows us to appropriately triage them. Uh, the most common activation of trauma is the middle column, which is our 811 trauma activation, and those have both physiologic and mechanistic protocol. A more severe or more uh, critically ill patient qualifies as a 911 trauma activation. Both of these help us determine how to triage this patient. When the patient gets to the hospital, an additional final exchange of information happens between the pre-hospital team and the hospital team where essential elements are delivered uh, to uh, uh, communicated. This is an additional final exchange of information. Uh, the details of the injury, the vital signs obtained at the scene and during transport, the pertinent physical exam findings and the initial treatments. Most importantly, the patient's response to these treatments. All of that is uh, given to the hospital providers. The pre-hospital providers give their report before the hospital providers start any part of their evaluation or even transfer the patient in onto the emergency room bed. Obtaining a record of pre-hospital events completes the formal information exchange between the two sets of providers, contains critical information for early intervention, and these allow this, this information to be shared successfully before the in-hospital team takes over and becomes uh, focused on the care of the patient. So we think, what do we do when a trauma is coming in? We get the alert, we go down there. In our minds, when Mark and I are going down there, we, we feel like this is what we look like, right? We're headed that way, we're gonna go save somebody's life. Um, when we get there, this is what the trauma bay typically looks like, right? There's a thousand people in there, it is, it's chaos, uh, and you don't have any idea where the patient is in the mix. Advanced Trauma Life Support, or ATLS, is a framework for the systematic evaluation of trauma patients to improve outcomes and reduce missed injuries. This includes pre-hospital trauma care, which involves life-saving intervention and basic life support in the field by EMS, and providing rapid transportation to the nearest appropriate hospital. In the hospital, the assessment of trauma patients begins with a primary survey in which life-threatening conditions are identified and treated using a sequential ABCDE approach. Once the patient is stabilized, a secondary survey is performed, including a thorough history, a physical exam, and radiographic studies. The tertiary survey is performed within 24 hours of presentation to identify any missed injuries. ATLS is a program that's been around for 40 years. It covers six continents. It's in 86 countries. Over 64,000 courses have been provided to 1.1 million students, all in an effort to provide healthcare professionals with access to education that will enhance their ability to accurately provide an initial assessment, a resuscitation, stabilization, and help determine the next steps in the care of the injured patient. And so we employ this strategy at our hospital, and again, I said an ABCDE approach. A key tenant of this uh, ATLS curriculum is the ABCDE algorithmic approach to the assessment of the injured patient. This is airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure, and it's not applicable to patients that are already in cardiac arrest um, where the, the typical uh, ACLS guidelines should be used. But with an ABCDE approach, initial assessment and treatment are performed simultaneously. <clears throat> 
Again, this is what we see when we get to the room, right? Ideally, we would have a limited amount of patients in the room that are all performing specific tasks. These types of, of protocol exist throughout the country where we limit the number of patient uh, of, of providers in the room. Everyone has a specified position. Everyone has a specified goal uh, and task. And, and there is a team leader standing at the foot of the bed. I chose this algorithm. This is from Canada. This is not specific to our facility, but I like this one because the surgeon is standing at the bottom with his arms crossed. And I thought he might be good to have a cup of coffee, um, kind of just directing the care of the patient. But as you can see, there's a couple of green faces at the bottom of this slide, so uh, warns you what's coming next. So when we show up to a trauma, we follow the ABCDE protocol. Most important in trauma patients is assessing the airway and maintaining a stable airway. We see patients like this. This is a patient that suffered an inadvertent gunshot wound to the face at this facility. This patient was miraculously intubated by the emergency room staff. Um, and, and so this is the initial challenge when you're presented with a trauma patient is obtaining the airway. Relieving an obstructed airway is the single greatest priority in any, any injured trauma patient. An obstructed airway results in inadequate oxygenation and ventilation, causes severe hypoxemia, and results in death within minutes. In general, airway patency is expediently assessed by noting the patient's ability to talk and ventilate spontaneously in the absence of strider or accessory muscle use. Any compromise must be dealt with immediately. Even without an airway injury, the hemodynamically unstable patient should have definitive airway control early. This helps prevent aspiration, maximizes the uh, systemic oxygen delivery, corrects any acid-base disturbances, and allows us to focus on their other life-threatening issues. In the appropriate patient, a rapid sequence intubation uh, can quickly facilitate intubation. Uh, ha careful consideration must be given to the patient with a closed head injury and raised intracerebral pressure, uh, any kind of airway or cervical spine trauma, contraindications to a paralytic or anatomic markers of a difficult intubation. It's essential that uh, the intubationist be skillful in the airway management and that both an auxiliary plan and personnel are available should intubation attempt fail. Uh, cricothyroidotomy or uh, both needle or surgical cricothyroidotomy uh, are the most efficient backup techniques uh, and you know there are an array of potential adjunctive airway capture devices that are available. Spinal precautions must be maintained throughout airway assessment and management because spinal cord injuries happen in up to 20 percent of trauma patients. In both cardiac tamponade and tension pneumothoraces, once you remove the intrathoracic pump and institute positive pressure ventilation, this might further impede venous return and exacerbate cardiovascular collapse. So we see a fair uh, incidence of trauma patients uh, decompensating upon intubation. After successful intubation, it's crucial that the endotracheal tube position be confirmed. Uh, emergency intubation doubles the risk of tube malposition. Confirmation via physical exam is limited, and I, I didn't know this, but 60% of right stem intubations happen with equal breath sounds documented, and 70% uh, happen despite symmetric chest excursion. Bilateral breath sounds are often heard by the uh, anesthetist despite esophageal intubation. So adequate ventilation should be confirmed with the use of capnography. Uh, this will not, of course, detect a right main stem intubation, but um, you know, the chest x-ray in addition to capnography as well as arterial blood gases should be obtained to confirm adequacy of ventilation, oxygenation, perfusion, and tube placement. After securing the airway, the resuscitating clinician quickly addresses breathing and responds to life-threatening thoracic injuries. Uh, these are responsible for about 25% of trauma deaths. Rib fractures are the most common serious thoracic injury, and pneumothoraces are the most common intrathoracic injury following blunt trauma. Most of these um, are treated with a chest tube, but the patient in physiologic distress may need emergency thoracotomy, or, uh, and that's to control massive air leaks or hemorrhage, especially after penetrating injury. Life-threatening thoracic injuries should be detected during a primary survey. These include tension pneumothoraces, massive hemothoraces, cardiac tamponade, and flail chest. The standard examination for these includes observing for external injuries, such as open wounds, uh, uh, the, the, the classic sucking chest wound, leaking air, or chest wall deformity. This is followed by palpation for crepitus, deformity, or asymmetric respiratory motion. And auscultation is then carried out in both apical and lateral chest areas. 
Pneumothoraces are a preventable cause of post-traumatic death. They have a one in five incidence in victims of major trauma and uh, may cause catastrophic cardiopulmonary derangements when compared with other thoracic injuries of comparable anatomic severity. 13% of preventable death uh, uh, are related to management of the airway and chest injuries in the emergency department. The most concerning type of pneumothorax is, of course, attention pneumothorax. Delays in diagnosis and treatment of this result in respiratory and circulatory collapse. In the unstable patient, pneumothoraces should be diagnosed clinically by noting diminished breath sounds, hyperresonance to percussion, increased jugular venous distension, and mediastinal shift. When instability is present, we don't wait for a chest x-ray to confirm. In reality, a patient with uh, hypovolemia and delayed x-rays, a diminished breath sound may be the only appreciable sign uh, in the noisy resuscitation environment. And so uh, we provide chest tube placement um, uh, immediately. Typically, uh, treatment is needle decompression of the pleural space followed by chest tube insertion. If there's no response to needle decompression, a formal finger or tube thoracostomy is required to ensure that the pneumothorax is not being missed. When there's no time for a chest x-ray, you can use an ultrasound to diagnose and record the presence of pneumothorax uh, and also document the successful evacuation of air from the pleural space. So this is a, just an x-ray of a successful chest tube uh, placement. And in addition to ventilatory insufficiency, thoracic trauma can also induce circulatory insufficiency and shock. Most common hemothorax cause is bleeding from lacerated intercostal arteries, although hemodynamically unstable patients also may have injuries to the great vessels, to the heart, or the lungs. Intercostal arteries uh, bleeding typically uh, accumulate relatively slowly and, and can be tamponaded by timely re-expansion of the lung through chest tube insertion. So after we uh, expediently assess the thorax, attention focuses on the circulatory system, recognizing that circulatory insufficiency may have already become apparent during our chest examination. You know, a lot of these things are not A, then B, then C. All of it's happening at the same time. The patient is again observed and spoken to. Pulses are assessed manually. Worrisome findings, are, of course, are diminished consciousness, pallor, profound tachycardia, or uh, any kind of weak or imperceptible pulse. Obtaining circulatory stability in unstable patients usually requires identifying the injury after initiating the resuscitation. Otherwise, the patient's likely to die. If we wait to identify the injury prior to initiating the resuscitation, typically the patient doesn't do well. It has recently been reported that during the first 90 minutes of an emergency room visit, patients who were hypotensive with major abdominal injuries requiring, eventually requiring laparotomy sustained an additional 1% increase in mortality for every three minutes spent in the emergency room. When faced with an unstable trauma patient, treatment begins according to a presumptive diagnosis of hypovolemia, even before a specific diagnosis is confirmed. Preventing shock by arresting hemorrhage remains the most important task of the trauma surgeon and is the major focus of this talk. The physical examination and simple bedside diagnostic adjuncts, notably portable x-ray, pelvic x-ray, and portable ultrasound, typically suggest the etiology and, most importantly, the potential site of uh, anatomic origin. The seriously injured patient is dynamic, of course, and uh, may ultimately illustrate more than one co uh, cause of their hypovolemia as time progresses. We must have a high index of suspicion and clinically reassess the patient. So as you can see, there are several sites that we can identify through physical exam or through adjunctive studies immediately in the emergency room to determine the site of bleeding. We identify intraperitoneal bleeding through a fast exam or sometimes through a DPL, diagnostic peritoneal lavage. Retroperitoneal bleeding can be presumed or suspected based on pelvic x-ray. Thoracic bleeding is uh, uh, evident on a chest x-ray. Obviously, multiple long bone fractures or uh, external bleeding is visible on physical exam. A fast exam is the focused uh, assessment by sonography for trauma. And this is a, an ultrasound evaluation uh, determining sources of hemoperitoneum and hemopericardium. Uh, the sensitivity and specificity of fast exam are exceedingly high. Uh, this is used in all trauma patients, but especially in the hemodynamically unstable trauma patient. The four ultrasound windows that are evaluated uh, on the abdominal portion of the FAST exam are the, epi uh, the epigastrium and pericardium. Morrison's pouch is at the liver and the kidney. It's the splenorenal space at the spleen and the kidney, and the pouch of Douglas in the pelvis. And these allow us to determine uh, if there's any source of intra-abdominal bleeding that could be contributing to the patient's hypotension. This is a, an ultrasound shot of, uh, of course, this is how all of our ultrasounds look, um, of uh, Morrison's pouch. Again, we got two green faces on this one, so it's not quite as bad as the last one, but this is an obvious source of why the patient's 
hypotensive. All right, this is a patient we took care of here that uh, wrecked his motorcycle and he's got fracture dislocations of several segments of his right leg. Um, those are the easy patients to determine what the cause is. There are patients that are obvious, that are much less obvious that are, are um, that present to our trauma, trauma bay and, and we have to determine what their cause is. The main disability in the primary survey to be assessed for uh, D disability is neurologic condition and neurologic condition uh, has to do with the brain of course. Abnormal neurologic status can be caused by primary brain injury. Systemic conditions can affect brain perfusion, shock, hypoxia, intoxication. We assess the level of consciousness by using the Glasgow Coma Score, looking for pupillary response and for limb movement. The best way to prevent injury to the brain is to maintain adequate airway, breathing, and circulation. Here's a refresher of the GCS. And the final uh, uh, portion of the primary exam is E, exposure. Exposure portion involves assessment of the whole body to avoid, uh, trying to avoid any missed injuries. We're looking for, uh, we're addressing the patient fully, we're examining their back, we're maintaining C-spine immobilization, we're looking for any kind of clues that could, could explain what's going on with the patient. In trauma, you're looking for burns, you're looking for additional penetrating injuries. Sometimes a patient presents with a rash or some kind of skin um, uh, cutaneous manifestation. We occasionally see patients that prevent with infected wounds, uh, gangrene. We can look for toxins and other drugs such as needle marks, chemicals, patches. You see insect bites, bite marks, embedded ticks. Sometimes patients come with catheters, tubes, implants, surgical scars. Uh, we had a patient the other day that came in with a tracheostomy and so there's always there's something that you can get on the, uh, the exposure portion of the exam. And then most importantly in these trauma patients as we'll see later with their, their temperatures that we provide, once we've taken all their clothes off, we provide them with warm blankets to, to uh, maintain normothermia. So this patient comes in, we have a patient coming to the emergency room, we're all evaluated through the ATLS protocol through the ABCDE algorithmic approach. These patients based on their hemodynamic status are stable, unstable, or in extremis. So a patient that's in extremis is managed a little bit differently than the the stable or unstable patient. These patients have completely decompensated physiologically and any of their physiologic abnormalities must be reversed for a chance of survival. All procedures that are performed in these patients must be therapeutic. Their condition doesn't allow for any diagnostic procedure. So instead of a chest x-ray, we put in bilateral chest tubes because that only, not only diagnoses them but fixes the problem that you might find. Once they've stabilized, they get a secondary survey, a complete physical exam in the hemodynamically stable patient. This is when a chest x-ray and a pelvic x-ray are performed in the trauma bay, again, in the hemodynamically stable patient. This is not the time for extremity films. This might be the take-home message of the whole uh, talk. This is one of my biggest pet peeves, is when we're in the emergency room and we have a patient who's unwell and they're getting x-rays of the hands and the ankles. Many life-threatening images can be elucidated on these chest and pelvic x-rays before you go to the CT scanner. So this is where you're looking for a pneumothorax that's going to cause the patient to decompensate when they're in the scanner. Everyone that does trauma knows that the patient decompensates in radiology. That's where it always happens. And so if we're trying to prevent that from happening, the chest x-ray, the pelvic x-ray are things that allow us to prevent that from happening. This is probably the most important slide of the whole talk. This is, if you've heard the, the, this talk, there's a variation of this talk I've given before, and the most important slide of this whole talk. And I tell our APPs this all the time. These are the causes of low blood pressure and trauma. And so if you're gonna write anything down, this is the thing to write down on this whole slide. Of course, the very first one is bleeding, right, obviously. Number two is hemorrhage. Number three, blood loss. And number four is exsanguination. So I couldn't think of any other word. I would have done 10 if I knew 10 words for bleeding because that's the most common cause of low blood pressure and trauma. 99% of the time we hear about the patient's hemoglobin in the emergency room. I tell our APPs every time, I don't care if their hemoglobin's 35, if they're hypotensive for a trauma, they need blood. With the exception of head injuries, inadequate oxygenation delivery in the, is the final common pathway that results in death in these patients. Hypoxemia secondary to airway obstruction and ventilation obviously is fatal within minutes. We handle that as soon as they arrive. Shock is a state of oxygen delivery insufficient to sustain normal tissue and cellular function. Regardless of how it's caused, it represents an advanced arrangement of cellular and organ bioenergetics. Although it is not the only cause of post-traumatic shock, hemorrhage is the most prevalent by far. Hemorrhagic shock marked by hypotension is rarely seen in patients with less than 30% of blood volume deficit. 
Once you've started to show hemodynamic derangement, you've lost more than 30% of your blood volume. This reflects an advanced state of physiologic exhaustion. So from a practical bedside standpoint, all trauma patients with overt or occult shock are presumed to be suffering from hemorrhagic shock until proven otherwise. Although it must be recognized that this assumption in some cases might lead to excessive volume resuscitation. The consequence we aren't necessarily sure of, but we understand that there, there probably is a consequence. Of course, there are some other causes of shock. Oh, that, so this is a, a table that shows even if the patient's not bleeding onto the bed, not out into the floor, fractured bones cause blood loss. We get patients that have 12 rib fractures, so you can lose up to 125 cc's with each rib fracture, a forearm fracture up to half a liter, and you can see how it progresses, and so even though the patient is not visibly losing blood, you can lose your entire blood volume with orthopedic trauma. There are some other causes of hypotension and trauma, so I will admit that. Um, they must be considered, especially if the patient doesn't respond to the initial measures which would be blood administration. Obstructive shock is related to mechanical uh, uh, impairment of the venous return to the heart, prevents cardiac filling. These are tension pneumothoraces and cardiac tamponade. Neurogenic shock results from the loss of vasomotor tone to peripheral vascular to be beds and is almost always associated with an acute spinal cord injury. Cardiogenic shock is the direct result of circulatory pump failure. And typically that's something that happens prior to the trauma. Septic shock is unusual in trauma, but the patient might present late as seen in developing countries. There are endocrinologic emergencies such as adrenal insufficiency, diabetic ketoacidosis, and mixed edema coma that might precipitate a traumatic event. And then there is a, uh, a quote unquote traumatic shock that's been conceptualized as an independent post-inflammatory state secondary to immune activation that's superimposed on the traumatic injury, although this is likely indistinguishable from organ dysfunction that often develops after the resuscitation of the severe injury. Over 60% of these trauma patients are hypovolemic. Some hypotension is related to isolated head injuries. About 15% of trauma is related to quote unquote other causes, which is primarily obstructive shock. So the goal, the actual discussion here today, we'll go, I don't know what time it is, but we'll, we'll go fast. The goals of the resuscitation. So we control the bleeding, we restore perfusion, we attempt to minimize iatrogenic injury, and we try to promote hemostasis. And not necessarily in that order, but rather all going on at the same time. So first let's talk about controlling bleeding. We use the fastest strategy possible to get hemorrhage control. That might be a tourniquet, it might be direct pressure, it might be packing, it might be suture, it might be the operating room. Any way that we can get bleeding control is, is you know, the fastest strategy is, is the goal. You have to be systematic in finding the bleeding. So there's a mnemonic that I found in preparation for this that's called scalper. Scalp, chest, abdomen, long bones, pelvis, extremities, retroperitoneum. And so basically the, the things you can see and then some of the things you can't see are all places a person can bleed to death. I should have warned you. There was a green guy on the picture prior to this. This is a scalp laceration. Uh, that we did not too long ago, and this lady had two liters of clotted blood inside her scalp above her uh, calvarium. She was intubated for hypotension and altered mental status. We washed it out, we fixed it, she was extubated the next day and she went home. So a scalp injury in and of itself was her only injury and caused her to be hemodynamically unstable and require um, uh, intubation. An example of a guy we just took care of, he's got a significant scalp laceration here on his ear, uh, was intubated for altered mental status and blood loss. This is what I'd like to take credit for, but as one of the facial surgeons did, it looked pretty good when he was done. Um, and then finally, this one here is a lady that came in hemodynamically unstable. She was healthier, didn't require intubation, but had a fairly significant scalp laceration. So those don't contribute to the talk at all, but they're interesting to look at. How do you apply a tourniquet? This is what a tourniquet looks like. The tourniquet is a, a canvas strap that has Velcro and it has this plastic rod called a windlass rod that you twist. So here's how the Stop the Bleed program describes putting on a tourniquet. If you come across a person that's bleeding in picture one, you can see you apply direct pressure. If direct pressure doesn't stop that bleeding, you apply a tourniquet if you have one. You can make a tourniquet, but these are commercially available tourniquets that, are, um, that people have. You put the tourniquet two to four inches above the wound. Um, you insert the strap, you tighten it down as best you can, and then you twist the windlass rod. And the windlass rod attempts to tighten down even further uh, over the extremity. 
And uh, this schematic shows, again, that you place this a few inches above. You do not place the tourniquet over a joint. And this does not obviously work. Tourniquets don't work on neck or torso trauma. They only work on extremity trauma. Direct pressure is the better bet for torso trauma. Couple of green guys on this one. This young lady came in after a motorcycle wreck. Uh, she has a tourniquet in place from life-threatening hemorrhage. This lady ended up uh, succumbing to her injuries. This is a mangled extremity that she essentially bled to death from and had a, a non-survivable anoxic injury. Uh, this tourniquet is applied appropriately. It's as high as it can be above the wound, uh, and it is not over any joints. So tourniquets, are, do they do any good, right? So a turn, we had a multi-center study uh, performed in 2022 of 1,400 trauma patients that require, had extremity injuries requiring a trauma center, and they either received a tourniquet or they didn't. Tourniquets controlled bleeding in 87% of these patients. These patients were, uh, were significantly, uh, statistically more likely to present to the emergency room uh, with normal blood pressures than patients that didn't have tourniquets. So the non-tourniquet patients presented in shock more frequently than the tourniquet patients. There was no difference in long-term limb complications in these patients. So the take-home message is that tourniquets decrease the incidence of shock without an increase in limb complications. Or the test, these are all the test questions for the end. Chest injuries stop, are typically caused by intercostal artery bleeds. Intercostal artery bleeds uh, are extinguished typically by re-expansion of the lung. We were taught in training that that required a large bore chest tube. A study out of Seattle most recently in 2021 uh, looked at pigtail catheters versus large bore chest tubes in the, for hemothorax. Now these are hemodynamically stable patients. The unstable patient still gets a large bore chest tube. But in the hemodynamically stable patient with a, a hemonumothorax, a, a non-inferiority study showed that pigtail catheters had equal drainage rates and complication rates uh, as compared to large bore chest tubes. A lot of talk, if you go to any trauma meeting uh, in the last five years, you're going to hear about the Reboa catheter. The Reboa catheter is a, ca it, it, the idea is catheter-based hemorrhage control. This is what the Reboa catheter looks like. Reboa stands for retrograde endovascular balloon occlusion of the aorta. We know hemorrhage is a leading cause of trauma-related mortality. Reboa has been proposed as a less invasive alternative to the resuscitative thoracotomy. This catheter is inserted through the femoral artery, is advanced up into the aorta in the, the chest, and the, the balloon is deployed to attempt to control abdominal hemorrhage or pelvic hemorrhage. These are the Reboa zones. Reboa zone one is from the subclavian artery to the celiac trunk. Reboa zone two is typically an unused zone because it's difficult to occlude the bleeding vessel at this location, but it's from the celiac trunk to the lowest renal artery. And then the Reboa zone three is from the lowest renal artery to the aortic bifurcation. The indications for Reboa are non-compressible hemorrhage below the diaphragm in the abdomen, pelvis, or the retroperitoneum. These patients typically have a positive FAST exam. They might have a pelvic fracture with a negative FAST exam, which could indicate a retroperitoneal hemorrhage, uh, or these patients have a traumatic cardiac arrest. If you have a suspected traumatic abdominal hemorrhage, you deploy the Reboa in zone one. If you have a suspected blunt pelvic injury or a groin junctional hemorrhage, you can deploy the Reboa in zone three. Contraindications to this are children under the age of 18 or uh, elderly folks over the age of 70. Any kind of atraumatic cardiac arrest is a contraindication. Aortic dissection and cardiac tamponade are contraindications. So does Reboa actually work? This is all the, the, the rage in, in all the big academic trauma centers. Uh, they are deploying Reboa catheters with almost every trauma. And so we've done a lot of studies because of that to determine if it actually helps. In 2019, a retrospective case control analysis of 140 trauma patients undergoing Reboa placement showed that there was a, 20, a higher 24-hour mortality, a higher rate of renal insufficiency, and a higher rate of lower limb amputation in the Reboa group as compared to standard care. In addition, there was a longer time to definitive intervention, either to interventional radiology, angioembolization, or to laparotomy. Another study more recently uh, was a prospective multi-center study uh, 
looking at uh, aortic occlusion in zone one, which was above the celiac artery, versus resuscitative thoracotomy, so us opening the chest in the emergency room. The primary outcome was did the patient live or not. There was a thousand patients involved. They matched patients based on their uh, variables, uh, propensity score matching, and that gave us 56 pairs of patients to look at. The take home from this was that aortic occlusion in zone one for the Reboa catheter was associated with a better or similar survival to resuscitative thoracotomy. And we were looking at 93% mortality with ER thoracotomy versus 80% mortality with Reboa catheter. So essentially everyone still didn't make it, but a few more patients made it, and it was a statistically significant finding. All of this is in an effort to avoid what's called the trauma lethal triad. Trauma causes hemorrhage, hemorrhage causes acidosis, hemorrhage causes hypothermia. Both acidosis and hypothermia cause coagulopathy. Coagulopathy causes additional hemorrhage, which leads you into the death spiral that happens in trauma. As you'll see as we move on from a little bit further, fluid administration and operative exposure both contribute to this death triad. So next we're gonna talk about uh, well, let's conclude uh, controlling bleeding, right? So the strategy is that you have to be methodical. Uh, you use the fastest strategy possible. You uh, use tourniquets. They cause less shock, no limb complications. Chest tube is probably okay uh, to use a pigtail catheter in, in hemodynamically stable patients. We're still uh, uh, following what we have always done for unstable patients with large bore catheters. And Reboa is still being used nationally, but we're just not quite sure if it's, uh, uh, if it's helpful to folks. Uh, we do not use Reboa at this facility. Our next uh, area of discussion is restoring perfusion. So what do we do when the patient comes in? We know that blood products are better than crystalloids in trauma. That's been proven. We know that uh, the uh, proper trial, which is the pragmatic randomized optimal platelet and plasma ratio trial, was designed to address the effectiveness and the safety of a one-to-one-to-one -one -to -one transfusion ratio. This used almost 700 trauma patients, and they looked at a one-to-one-to-one -one -to -one ratio versus a one-to-one-to-two -one ratio for these products. And there was no overall difference in mortality, but one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio achieved hemostasis faster and experienced death due to exsanguination less frequently. So the current evidence shows that plasma platelets and PRVCs in a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio is the best strategy for resuscitation of a trauma patient with hemorrhagic shock. When do we do massive transfusion protocols? So massive transfusion historically is defined as the replacement of greater than 10 units of PRBCs within 24 hours. Sometimes it's arbitrarily defined as replacing the patient's entire blood volume in less than 24 hours, or the acute administration of more than half the patient's estimated blood volume over three hours. So who needs it? We have scoring systems to determine who needs a massive transfusion. The ABC scoring system is the assessment of blood consumption score. It uses four uh, markers, penetrating mechanism, positive fast exam, a systolic blood pressure less than 90 or a heart rate greater than 120. A score of greater than or equal to two uh, is, is very sensitive and specific to predict the need for massive transfusion. And a lot of facilities use this as their, their trigger for massive transfusion. More. Uh, Refined is the uh, revised assessment of bleeding and transfusion, the rabbit score, and this uses penetrating injury, positive fast, a, uh, excuse me, a uh, shock index of greater than one, and pelvic fractures as their markers, and any two or greater of these it predicts massive transfusion. Shock index is heart rate divided by systolic blood pressure, meaning your heart rate is higher than your blood pressure, and so that would be a pretty good marker of, of determining a hype of a shock. When examining vital signs, the shock index is a better indicator of shock than hypotension alone and is more sensitive than individual vital sign analysis. And so this is also what some facilities use as their trigger for massive transfusion. Finally, this study show, uh, looked at ratios, uh, a, a low ratio of uh, uh, platelet, uh, FFP to uh, uh, PRBCs versus a high ratio. Ultimately, the one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ended up being one-to-one-to-one point -to -one -to -one four ratio uh, achieved hemostasis faster and was independently associated with improved hemostasis. So what about whole blood? Whole blood is something that's been talked about a lot in the trauma literature recently. Theoretically, fresh whole blood replaces all the blood components that are lost in trauma, including platelets and fully functional clotting factors. 
In addition, components of whole blood are more functional than their stored counterparts. Separating blood into components results in dilution and loss of about half the viable platelets, PRBCs, and clotting factors. It decreases the coagulation activity of the separated components as compared to whole blood itself. So if you look at the bottom of this slide, if you add up all the components to equal a unit of whole blood, which is 500 cc's, you get about 675 cc's. 675 cc's with a hematocrit of 29 percent, a platelet count of 88,000, and 65 percent coagulation activity. As compared to 500 cc's with a hematocrit of almost 50 percent, almost 400,000 platelets, fibrinogen of 1,000, and 100 percent coagulation factors. There are a lot of societies that are advocating for whole blood. Some of the advantages that are uh, purported are, uh, in, of course, it improves the logistics of massive transfusion in that you would transfuse one bag as opposed to two to three separate components. Whole blood is more concentrated, so you receive less volume. It contains fewer additives. It's a better hemostatic profile as compared to component therapy. Um, the the uh, uh, Cold stored platelets in whole blood have better hemostatic function and a longer shelf life versus the room temperature platelets. Transfusing whole blood reduces the incidence of ABO incompatibility and clerical errors, and um, transfusing whole blood reduces the patient's exposure to donors. So obviously studies have been performed looking at these, looking at low titer O whole blood versus component therapy alone. Some of the studies looked at uh, an initial o low titer O whole blood and then component therapy versus component therapy alone. And ultimately it showed that there's promise in whole blood. Mortality was not changed, but it did appear that whole blood patients required less to re achieve hemostasis. And so we know that our current literature suggests that whole blood shows promise, a treatment strategy is needed, but there's obviously a lot of studies that are ongoing in regards to whole blood. Our facility uh, has gotten on the whole blood train, and uh, as of November 6th, we now initiate whole blood administration in our trauma patients who qualify. Qualifying for whole blood is any male who's an adult over the age of 18 and any female that's older than childbearing age, so any female over the age of 55. And those patients are, are uh, receiving whole blood. We actually administered our first unit of whole blood the other day. Uh, and so it was a, a big step for the blood bank and the pathology department. We're, we're excited about that. Whether under or over resuscitation is the issue, clinical judgment uh, with tests more accurately reflecting metabolic derangements at the tissue level how, is how we determine uh, if we are resuscitating the patient reasonably, right? So we need markers of resuscitation. Serum lactate and base deficit are, um, are, are our most reliable markers of resuscitation. So these are measured from venous or arterial blood gases. This first graph on the left shows uh, that the more negative the base deficit correlates with an increased mortality. The graph on the right shows the, how quickly the lactate is cleared, how quickly the lactate decreases is associated with mortality. And of course we have the Foley catheter, right? So the patient making urine is being perfused. If your patient is producing 30 to 50 cc's an hour of urine, renal perfusion is adequate, which means your resuscitation is adequate. So we restore perfusion. We stop the bleed, we restore perfusion. The proper trial shows us that one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one resuscitation with plasma platelets and PRBCs. Massive transfusion protocol helps us avoid dilutional coagulopathy by providing appropriate uh, um, blood products. Whole blood is showing promise and the markers of resuscitation are base deficit, the change in our lactate and urine output. This is a leg that's mangled, just in case lunch was putting you to sleep. So we try not to hurt these folks, right? Um, the next thing is to avoid, uh, minimize iatrogenic injury. So there is such an idea as permissive hypotension. Maintaining a lower blood pressure than physiologic levels in patients suffering from hemorrhagic shock has been studied extensively. This comes from the idea of the scoop and run of the urban uh, inner cities where they were recognizing that patients that were brought by private vehicle were doing better than those that came by EMS. And, and they thought, why is that? No one's doing anything for the patient until they get here. And the idea is that if you uh, keep the blood pressure slightly lower, then the patient might bleed less, right? So this study by Dutton in 2002 uh, was 110 trauma patients with hemorrhagic shock, and they randomized these people to two resuscitation protocols. One had a target pressure of 100, the other had a target pressure of 70. Uh, 
There's Dutton. He did this study. Um, <laughs> stupid. Um, I did this late at night. That's a lot. There, it gets worse. Um, <laughs> And the goal was that the patients did the same. With the blood pressure goal of 70 and the blood pressure of 100, they, did this, they had the same outcomes. There was no different. If you look at the idea of cyclic hyperresuscitation, meaning you have a patient who has a low blood pressure or mean arterial pressure, <clears throat> you give them resuscitation, they turn into having a normal or high blood pressure, that causes them to bleed, they get a lower blood pressure, you resuscitate, and so it's this cyclic thing that, that uh, really has no end. And so targeting their physiologic markers of perfusion, like their mental status, their urine output, their capillary refill, is more important than an actual numeric blood pressure goal. Unless you're talking about traumatic brain injuries. So associated brain injuries are present in patients in about 60% of trauma patients with severe blunt trauma. And it frequently presents a conflict in management. You don't take a trauma patient that's hypotensive to the CT scanner, but knowing their neurologic condition and their brain injury is one of the most important parts of their resuscitation. And so the CT scan is one of the most important modalities in neurosurgical care. Hypotension occurs in about one third of patients with severe brain trauma and is one of the most important predictors of outcome. A single episode of hypotension, which is a systolic blood pressure less than 90, occurring during the period between injury and resuscitation increases the morbidity and doubles the mortality with severe traumatic brain injury. This study in 2012, uh, they bled a bunch of rats and they gave them traumatic brain injuries and they targeted mean arterial blood pressure resuscitation goals of 80, 100, and 120 millimeters of mercury at 15 minutes. Obviously, the highest mean arterial pressure target had the highest resuscitation amounts. Neurologic outcomes and mortality were inversely correlated with aggressiveness of resuscitation. A retrospective database review of over 7,000 traumatic brain injuries showed that a systolic blood pressure target greater than 90 had a mortality rate of 8%. Systolic blood pressure target less than 90 had a mortality rate of one-third. And so the take-home message in patients with TBI and hypovolemic shock, targeting a systolic of greater than or equal to 90 is the goal, but we also know that that's based on limited evidence. Do you give blood or do you give IV fluids? That might be the, maybe the actual most important part of the talk. So too much crystalloid resuscitation and traumatic hemorrhage shock, hemorrhagic shock increases dilutional coagulopathy as well as increased morbidity and mortality. All the way back to 1994, you look at these uh, delayed resuscitation versus immediate fluid resuscitation with penetrating torso trauma. Immediate fluid resuscitation at a higher mortality, more complications, and a hot, longer hospital length of stay. Normal saline is not blood, right? It's an electrolyte sol solute sub suspended in a water solvent, and it's far from normal. If you look at the electrolyte content of serum at the top part of the table and normal saline, which is the second row, it, nothing about it is similar. Hemorrhagic shock is blood failure. Goals of resuscitation include increasing the circulating volume, oxygen delivery, and hemostatic potential. Normal saline really addresses none of these things. Normal saline worsens acidosis and coagulopathy. With that, you get a decreased cardiac contractility, uh, cardiac chronicity, decreased effectiveness of the circulating catecholamines, decreased fibrinogen concentration, and impaired thrombin generation. Normal saline worsens acidosis, as we said. So you get the trauma-induced coagulopathy, right? That's what happens immediately after the trauma. There's nothing that we can do to prevent that. You also get an iatrogenic coagulopathy, which um, initiating IV fluids furthers these things with improper fluid resuscitation strategies. Again, we're trying to avoid this lethal triad in trauma. So if you give uh, the wrong fluid or you give something that's detrimental to the patient, you only make this worse. Hypothermia, a severe hypothermia is associated with high mortality in trauma. Most commonly it happens in the emergency room or in the operating room with exposure of the peritoneum. And these patients are hypocoagulable once their blood pressure, or their body temperature is less than 34 degrees Celsius. Acidotic patients, um, uh, excuse me, metabolic acidosis is the predominant physiologic defect resulting from persistent hypoperfusion. At less than 7.2, we get decreased cardiac contractility, cardiac output, we get vasodilatation, hypotension, bradycardia, dysrhythmias, decreased blood flow to the liver and kidneys. Acidosis also acts synergistically with hypothermia and its detrimental effect on the coagulation cascade. 
There's a green guy on this slide, and that's because a really nasty looking diagram is coming up. Um, but if you look at it, you know, so trauma causes hemorrhage, hemorrhage causes shock, shock causes the acute, <coughs> excuse me, coagulopathy of trauma. Trauma, hemorrhage, cause, it leads to resuscitation, which causes dilution and causing hypothermia, which causes shock. Shock causes acid, acid, uh, excuse me, acidosis, which leads to hypothermia, coagulopathy. So it's a cyclic thing that, that um, really gets out of control if, if you don't have a good understanding of it. Coagulopathy of trauma is one of the single most accurate predictors of prognosis in trauma. It's one of the most significant challenges to the resuscitation effort. So again, this is the lethal triad. Crystalloid fluid resuscitation is counterproductive delays and, and delays of aggressive crystalloid fluid resuscitation until hemorrhage control is achieved improves outcomes. A little bit about vasopressors. We were taught when we were training that vasopressors were bad in trauma. We were concerned for worsening ischemia. In 2021, it was, uh, a study was done that uh, concluded that the pathophysiology of shock was more complex than that. Initially, you have a sympathoexcitatory phase that's characterized by vasoconstriction, tachycardia, and a preserved mean arterial pressure, followed by a subsequent sympathoinhibitory phase where you get vasodilatation and leading to hypotension. And so we, we understand that the resuscitation of trauma shock needs to be appropriate balance of intravascular volume and vascular tone. Another study looking at the uh, use of angiotensin uh, in trauma uh, was uh, these pressors were only given um, after definitive hemorrhage control, and this resulted in less blood product administration at 48 hours, but no difference in mortality. And so the take-home message is that blood pressure support is controversial and requires a somewhat nuanced approach in trauma. So to sum that up, Right, strategy of permissive hypotension, uh, the idea of it might be greater than the actual goal, right? The goal is a little bit unclear. Crystalloids, we try to minimize those as much as possible. Vasopressors require a nuanced approach, and traumatic brain injury targets are controversial. And the final step is promoting hemostasis. First study we're looking at is the CRASH-2 trial. Uh, so tranexemic acid is an antifibrinolytic agent that can and should be used early in the resuscitation of bleeding trauma patients. CRASH-2 was a, a study of 20,000 adult trauma patients who were uh, hypotensive, and they looked at TXA administration uh, upon arrival and uh, over the next eight hours, uh, patients with injuries versus a placebo, and they found that the in-hospital mortality at 28 days was reduced in the TXA group. This next is a Kaplan-Meier curve, which everyone loves. Those are the best. The results of this showed that patients, so at the TXA, uh, uh, according to CRASH-2's protocol, had lower unadjusted mortality despite being more severely injured. Impacts particularly profound in massively transfused patients with an, and the, interestingly, their number needed to treat in this study was seven patients to prevent death related to coagulopathy. CRASH-3 uh, was done more recently uh, related to traumatic brain injuries in 12,000 patients. These patients were, had a diminished GCS and a known in, uh, intracranial hemorrhage without obvious extracranial injury. Uh, these patients were given TXA versus placebo, and they found that there was no difference in mortality in the TBI patients. The take home here is that TXA did not benefit the primary outcome of head injury related patients within 28 days. Cryoprecipitate uh, is uh, one of the, the products that we give in resuscitation. Fibrinogen is the primary substrate for clot formation along with platelets. There's a consistent link between falling fibrinogen levels and mortality in trauma, especially in the massively bleeding patient. Fibrinogen, in, in the massively bleeding patient, fibrinogen can drop to clinically important levels faster than other blood components, and its breakdown and synthesis are deleteriously affected by hypothermia and acidosis, as you can see here. This leads to a vicious cycle of abnormal clot formation and excessive bleeding. The key is to measure and follow serum fibrinogen in bleeding patients. A fibrinogen less than one identifies a hypofibrinogenic state, the antidote for which is cryoprecipitate. A study called the Cryostat-1 trial looked at cryo administration within 90 minutes of admi admission to the hospital and felt that it was safe. So we can give this medicine safely uh, and it's helping patients, uh, especially those in a hypofibrinogenic state. Um, 
What labs do you need to follow if you're resuscitating these patients? So we have platelet goals of greater than 50,000. For head injuries suspected, we'd like that platelet goal to be a little bit higher. We target our INR to be less than two. Again, fibrinogen, 150 to 1,000. Uh, there's 10 units, uh, uh, in 10 units of cryoprecipitate, there's 75 milligrams of fibrinogen. Uh, we give calcium based on uh, uh, blood product administration. The citrate in the blood products dilutes out the calcium in our blood. So calcium also augments clot formation. And so we provide calcium, one amp of calcium chloride or three amps of calcium gluconate for every six units of blood products. Transfusion and trauma is often empiric and it's based on traditional lab tests. We have viscoelastic tests such as uh, thromboelastography or rotational thromboelastometry, TAG and ROTEM. Uh, and these have been proposed as superior to traditional lab tests. These look at different values. They provide you a graph. They look at different values to determine where the, the breakdown in the clotting cascade is located uh, and also what the treatment for that breakdown is. That's something that uh, turn of 2024 we're going to be bringing to with uh, Dr. Dapowski in the blood bank and pathology department. We're going to be bringing to our emergency room here at McLeod. In this study, in 2020, 480 trauma patients getting the massive transfusion protocol that was augmented by viscoelastive studies versus the conventional uh, coagulation testing found that there was no difference in the proportion of patients alive and free of massive transfusion at 24 hours after injury, depending upon whether you used one or the other. Uh, so this didn't show any difference in TAG or ROTEM. But uh, when you're giving, the, you know, the take-home message of this is when you're giving blood products so rapidly, it's practically impossible to use standard tests to guide the resuscitation of blood products. By the time a set of labs has returned, you've given more blood, more products, so it's essentially obsolete. Of course, not every center has TAG or ROTEM, and so more evidence is needed to support or refute its use. I'm almost done. Should you give K-Centra or, or something similar, uh, a, a four-factor prothrombin complex concentrate to someone who's receiving massive transfusion? So this study in 2020, most recently in 2023, looked at 300 trauma patients that were receiving standard trauma resuscitation at risk of needing massive transfusion were randomized to either getting K-Centra empirically or placebo. There was no difference in the median 24-hour blood product consumption but there were significantly more thromboembolic events in the K-Centra group as compared to the, uh, those receiving standard care. And so the take home here is the addition of K-Centra or, or the like does not result in decreased blood product consumption compared to placebo and did result in a higher rate of thromboembolic events. So we try to promote hemostasis while all this other is going on. So we give TXA, cryoprecipitate is useful. We try to keep that between 100 and 1,000. Uh, platelets are a goal of 50,000, 100,000 brain injuries. We like to have an INR of less than two. Give calcium while giving blood products. And TEG could help us. We're not quite sure of the clinical significance, but we, we look forward to finding that out when we roll that out here at McLeod. Here's a mangled leg. Just to finish off, this is how that leg finished. That was his resuscitation. So uh, the final clinical take home of this talk is when you are resuscitating a trauma patient, we control the bleeding, we restore tissue transfusion, we try to minimize iatrogenic injury from the resuscitation itself, and we attempt to promote hemostasis. Are there any questions for us? One minute long. That's right. Yes, he did good. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I think that was a great talk. Uh, before anybody leaves, just a reminder: the Department of Medicine meeting is going to occur right now. Uh, so, if you're in the Department of Medicine, please stay. Uh, and also, a reminder to click on the. Uh, QR code to fill out the uh, evaluation uh, so you can get credit for the attending. So thank you all again. Thank you.